gopi janavala mere varadhai jaya radha marava punjali hari jaya radha marava punjali hari jaya radha marava कंतराज श्रीमाद भागवतम की नित्य गोपमानंदे नमः ओम विष्णु पदाया कृष्ण प्रस्ताय बुद्धले श्रीमते भक्ति बेदंत शामिनिति नमः नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवानि पचारिने निर्विशेष शनिवारे पश्चाचेर सतारिने Om Namo Bhagavate Bhāsudevāya Om Namo Bhagavate Bhāsudevāya Om Namo Bhagavate Bhāsudevāya We're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, fourth canto, is that correct? For what? For twenty-seven or something? For seventeen. And what's the verse? Twenty-nine or something? You you gonna put it anywhere? You're gonna have it on the screen or? I'll begin chanting, maybe I have, maybe you can chant with me. Dharo Vacha Nama Parasmai Purushaya Mayaya Vinyashta Nana Tanave Gunatmane Namaha Sarupanu Bhavena Anu Bhavena Nir Dhuta Dravya Kriya Karaka Vibra Mormaye Morma Dharovacha Nama Parasmai Purushaya Mayaya Parastan Shaya Mayaya Vinyashta Nana Tanave Gunatmane Tanave Gunatmane Nama Sarupanu Pavena Nirdhuta Pavena Nirdhuta Dravya Kriya Karata Vribra Mormaye Dharo Vacha, Dharo Vacha, Nama Parasmai Purushaya Mayaya, Nama Parasmai Purushaya Mayaya, Dinyashta Nana Tanave Gunatmane, Nama Sarupanu Bhavena Nirdutha, Namasuru. No, I just. Where where am I? Fourth line. Dravya kriya karaka vibrama amaye. Is this magnetic? Just want to get it underneath because it's kind of in the way a little bit. 
Tarovacha Nama Parasmai Purushaya Mayaya Vinyashta Nana Tanave Gunatmane Nama Sarupanu Bhavena Nirduta Dravya Kriya Karaka Vibramo Maye Ladies, Planet Earth, Earth. Uvacha, said, Namaha, Namaha. I offer my obeisances, obeisances. parasmai, unto the transcendent, transcendent. purushaya, Purushaya. unto the person, person. Mayaya. mayaya, by the material energy. Vinyasta, Vinyasta expanded. expanded. Nana, Nana, various. Is. Tanave, Tanave whose, forms. whose forms. Guna Atmane, Guna Atmane. Unto, the unto the source of the three modes of material nature. Namaha, Namaha. I offer my obeisances. Surupa of the real form. Anubhavena Bhavena by understanding. Nirdhuta not affected. Excuse me. Not affected by. Dravya matter. Kriya action. Karaka doer. Vipra bewilderment, bewilderment. Urmai, the, the waves of material existence. Translation. The planet Earth the planet Earth spoke. My dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, you are transcendental in your position. And by your material energy, you have expanded yourself in various forms and species of life through the interaction of the three modes of material nature. Unlike some other masters, 
you always remain in your transcendental position and are not affected by the material creation, which is subject to different material interactions. Consequently, you are not bewildered by material activities. It's interesting how when we read these prayers, different prayers like this in the Bhagavatam, and the prayers are actually like a philosophy class. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And, and you know, sometimes we say the gopis are simple, simple village girls, but you might read a prayer where they're explaining how Krishna is, you know, the Supreme Lord and the difference between the spiritual and material. It's a bit analytical and it's, you know, some tattvas there. So we see this, uh, it's a form of glorification by, you explain the philosophy, which is, but it's glorifying Krishna because the philosophy is that he's God and he's not bewildered by Maya, but it's, it's, it's both a philosophical explanation and a glorification. But it's just interesting how learned everyone is. You know, you know, this is Mother Earth, so all right, it's Mother Earth, but Mother Earth knows all these things. Purport, after King Prithu gave his royal command, the planet Earth in the shape of a cow could understand that the king was a directly empowered incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Consequently, the king knew everything past, present, and future. Thus, there was no possibility of the Earth's cheating him. The Earth was accused of hiding the seeds of all herbs and grains. And therefore, she is preparing to explain how the, how the seeds of these herbs and grains can again be exposed. The earth knew that the king was very angry with her. And she realized that unless she pacified his anger, there was no possibility of placing a positive program before him. He wanted to kill her, right? Yes, we're past that already. If you are not merciful, if you're not compassionate, you don't deserve to live. Wow. Wouldn't that be interesting if Modi decided to kill everyone who wasn't compassionate? You're not a human being if you're not compassionate. So we'll kill you. You're wasting oxygen. You know, let, it, let other people get it. Therefore, in the beginning of her speech, she very humbly presents herself as a part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead's body. She submits that the various bodily forms manifest in the physical world are but different parts and parcels of the supreme gigantic body. It is said that the lower planetary systems are parts and parcels of the legs of the Lord, whereas the upper planetary systems are parts and parcels of the Lord's head. The Lord creates this material world by his external energy. But this external energy is, in one sense, not different from him. Yet at the same time, the Lord is not directly manifest in the external energy, but is always situated in the spiritual energy. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 10, Maya Yakshena Prakriti, material nature is working under the direction of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord is not unattached to the external energy. And he is addressed in this verse as guna atma, the source of the three modes of material nature. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, text 15, nirgunam guna bhukti cha. Although the Lord is not attached to the external energy, he is nonetheless the master of it. The philosophy of Lord Chaitanya upholding that the Lord is simultaneously one with and different from his creation, achintya bheda bheda tattva, 
is very easily understandable in this connection. The planet Earth explains that although the Lord is attached to the external energy, he is near Dutta. He is completely free from the activities of the external energy. The Lord is always situated in his internal energy. Therefore, in this verse it is stated, Surupa Anubhavena. The Lord remains completely in his internal potency. And yet <clears throat> has full knowledge of the external energy as well as the internal energy, just as his devotee remains always in a transcendental position, keeping himself in the service of the Lord without being attached to the material body. It would really be strange, don't you think, if the devotee was transcendental but Krishna wasn't? <laughs> Sometimes Prabhupada makes that point. You know, you say Krishna is material or is bought temporary, whatever, and say his devotees are transcendental. How do they become transcendental? Because they're meditating on him, and if he's not transcendental, how would they become transcendental? Mm. There should be no difficulty in understanding this situation. Just as a devotee is never bewildered, never bewildered by his material body, the Lord is never bewildered by the external energy of this material world. A devotee is not hampered by the material body, although he is situated in a physical body that runs according to so many material condition, conditions, just as there are five kinds of air functioning within the body. And so many organs, the hands, legs, tongue, genitals, rectum, etc., all working differently. The spirit soul, the living entity who is in full knowledge of his position, is always engaged in chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, and is not concerned with the bodily functions. Although the Lord, the Lord is connected with the material world, he is always situated in his spiritual energy and is always unattached to the functions of the material world. As far as the material body is concerned, there are six waves or symptomatic material conditions, hunger, thirst, lamentation, bewilderment, old age, and death. The liberated soul is never concerned with these six physical interactions. The Supreme Personality of God at being the all-powerful master of all the energies has some connection with the external energy, but he is always free from the interactions of the external energy in the material world. <clears throat> Let's read the verse again. The planet Earth spoke, My dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, you are transcendental in your position, and by your material energy you have expanded yourself in various forms and species of life throughout the interaction of the three modes of material nature. Unlike some other masters, you always remain in your transcendental position and are not affected by the material creation, which is subject to different material interactions. Consequently, you are not bewildered by material activities. <clears throat> so when I was reading this verse, I was thinking, it's very easy just to read this verse and not think anything, because we already know Krishna's transcendental. We already know his position. I mean, we should know it. If you've been around a while, you understand this. And then I began thinking, well, there is something we don't understand about this, and that's our position. So we might, we might say, well, we're reading about Krishna. This is all like old news. We already know he's God and he's transcendental. But do you know you're not God? Well, do we know we're not God? Oh, you might say, yeah, I know. I'm servant of God. We can repeat it. But... When Krishna is described in Bhagavatam and it goes into more detail about how he's transcendental or how he's detached, uh, whatever attributes he has that are being described, part of what is supposed to go on in our brain and our heart is 
is to observe how none of that relates to me, and I'm trying to imitate that. I'm still, some little something's there, still trying to be something like Krishna, but as we read, no, this is what who Krishna is, and you can see I'm, I'm uselessly, hopelessly trying to imitate to some degree Krishna's position as supreme controller, because we all like to control. Right? We, the more we can control, the more, more, the more facility we have to control, generally, unless one is very pure, they take it, and it makes them feel good. And if it didn't make us feel good, there would be nobody who would want a mobile phone. And even if you had a mobile phone, there would be nobody who would want many apps, because all these things do is let you control more than you could ever have possibly imagined 50 years ago you could control. Right? And so, I mean, it, if you look at the way society is progressing with AI, with robots, with just, just where it is that right today with the control that we have, that we have more control than kings had you know, in history, right? There's anybody who can find, you know, a few thousand rupees can now have more control in their hand than kings had. So, of course, that's what we're trying to do in the material world. That's why we're here to control. And so, the problem facing society is that, that technology is putting more and more and more control in our hand, right? So, so, Jagannath Shami Ki Jai, Gonitai Ki Jai, Radhe Sham, Giridash Maharaj Ki Jai, Shri Nishinga Bhagavan Ki Jai, So, wait a few years, and basically, you can just say something to your phone, and, and something in your house will get done. Clean the toilet. <laughs> you know, some apparatus will clean it. Bake a potato. You, you come home, or cook a potato. You come home, it's cooked, right? Or, you know, I'm coming home, I'm walking to the door, open it, right? So that's, that's coming, right? It's already, we already have that to some degree, you know. New appliances are all Bluetooth and, you know, whatever. So it's just, you know, going like this to just talking it, it's like the technology is already there, right? Wait till the technology comes where you think it. You just think the baked potato and it's done. You think that's going to be a problem? Because what's happening is we're getting more and more power, more and more control that we should not have, it's dangerous for us. And that's why when Arjuna was offered technology, Krishna said, don't take it. Because it gives, it allows, we want to compete with God, and we're doing a really good job right now. I mean, you can never compete, but we're doing a better job than we've ever done because, you know, it's like we're all little demigods with all our little apps, you know. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, you can like, you can make a movie on your phone. People made movies on iPhones. Like, wow, that's crazy, right? These posters and all of that. How did you make it? Oh, I made it on my phone. Like, you know, 30 years ago, it would cost you like, you know, 5,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees to get someone to do that. You're making it on your phone. So look at, look at where things are going. It's giving us more and more control. It's just going to continue that way, right? Of course, yogis have more control. But this is for gross materialists who don't have that shakti. And so, we're reading about Krishna, and Krishna is the supreme controller. Yeah, yeah, I know that. He's transcendental to material energy. Yeah, yeah, I know that. He's one and different from his material energy. Yeah, yeah, I know that. He's never entangled in his material energy. Yeah, yeah, I know that. He just acts like ordinary person, set an example. Yeah, yeah, I know that. But do you know that you're not him? Do you know that you're competing with him? That's, that's 
why, that's what we should notice when we're reading all about, at least one of the things we should notice when we're reading about Krishna's activities, is, is how different he is from us. And just like we read about Krishna's activities in Brajlila, specifically the activities with the gopis, right? And so we know that those who are not trained or those who are not pure, when they read those activities, they want to imitate Krishna. But, and, you might, and then they say, Krishna is so immoral. Why is he doing this? He's setting a bad example. But he's not setting a bad example. He's setting the example that he can do this and you can't. Don't try this at home. Don't get your own gopis. That's, that's, you know, oh, I read 10th Canto. What'd you think? Oh, I'm out. I'm out to get looking for my own gopis now. Right? So the, the point of Krishna doing these things is, I can do this, you can't. Not that, yeah, do it, do it. I'm setting an example for you to imitate. No, I'm setting an example that you cannot do this. It's not your position. And you will enjoy through me. Just like the Manjuris, when you first hear about the Manjuris, you think, this is strange. They don't, they don't want to directly associate with Krishna. They only want to support Radharani. And, and the material mind thinks, well, that doesn't sound like any fun. You know, like Krishna comes and I have to like hide behind uh, Radharani or another gopi. But then you learn that when you do that, you get to experience the love, the bob that Radharani has. So that's better, right? It's just, it's just like it doesn't, this kind of thinking, we have material thinking, so you have to rethink everything, you have to re-understand everything, how everything works. So Krishna's on the altar with Radharani. Krishna is meeting Radharani every day at, at noon and Radha Kund and then in the evening in the groves of Vrindavan. We're hearing about it. Why are we hearing about it? What, what's going on here? Don't try this at home. That's why we're hearing about it. This is not for you. This is not what you do, right? Like we said last night, you can have one. Krishna has, has like, how many gopis does he have, you know? Like, I lost count. I lost count when I was a bhakta, right? So, you know, we give numbers, 16,000 wives, and you know, but... Rasalita's going on every night, and you know, new recruits are coming. <laughs> so it's like, wow. It's very dynamic. Um, so Krishna's doing all these things, and there's a message. Don't imitate this. I'm doing this. You understand who I am. You really have to understand who I am to understand who you are, because you are not me. And everything you learn about me, the, the subline is that you are not me. You say, oh, Krishna does this, and he's the supreme personality of God, and he's transcendental to the three modes of nature, and he's, he's, he's one and different from the material energy, and all these things. The subline is, and I am not. That's, the, that's, that's part, we, like, why? Why would Krishna come and do something horrible like steal other men's wives, and he's God. What kind of crazy example is that? This is what the moralists think, right? Why does he do that? To send you the message that you stole your wife from Krishna. That's his also. But I'll let you have one, and that's it. And if it doesn't work out, tough luck. And I will have unlimited wives and unlimited girlfriends and I will steal any man's wife I want. And what's the subline? The subline is, and you don't dare. And if you want to enjoy, then you serve my Leela and you will enjoy what I'm enjoying. You will understand transcendental enjoyment. That's the idea, right? So, so always when you're hearing, the, hearing about Krishna, think. Think about me and how I am not like this. So, I'll tell you a funny story. 
It's kind of like Prabhupada one-liner. Prabhupada is many, like just, you know, it's just like, whoa. Like whirlwind, like a tornado. You know? So, as you know, Srila Prabhupada spoke a lot about Mayavadis and impersonalists. And I don't know if you know this, but in America when Prabhupada came, whatever people knew of yoga and Indian philosophy was all Mayavad, because who was coming to America? Vivekananda came to America. So that's, in those days, that's probably where most people learned about spirituality. There were some other teachers, but in general, the impersonal idea dominated whatever Hindu philosophy was exported from India. And so that's why Prabhupada spoke about it a lot, because it was pervasive. That's like, every, you know, when people thought about Hinduism, that's what they thought. That we, you merge and you become one with God. So he spoke a lot about it, and one time he was speaking about it, and um, after he was asked a question, and somebody, I, th I think the question was, somebody said, could you just briefly explain what is Krishna consciousness? And because Prabhupada had been talking about impersonal Mayavad philosophy, I am God, you're God, we're all God, we just have to realize it. He said, Prabhupada was kind of joking, he said, yes, this is our philosophy. Krishna is great, God is great. You are not great, therefore you are not God. Just simple, right? That's it. That's our philosophy. <laughs> Could you explain Krishna consciousness in three sentences or less? Yes. God is great. You are not great. And people feel offended, of course. And therefore, you are not God. Yeah. So that, that's the whole point I'm trying to make. God is great. How great is he? Read about how great he is to understand you are not that great yourself. You are not that God. Hare Krishna. So, um, achinta beda, achinta beda, achinta beda, beda, abeda, beda, tattva. All right, so, this is interesting. Um, the word achintya, as you know, the word achintya means inconceivable. So, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you can spend the rest of your life trying to figure it out, but it's like... <laughs> You don't, really, you know, why waste time if it's inconceivable? What's the point? You know. So, when you think about Krishna as achintya, and you're trying to understand the achintya, why would you, you know, why would you, it's like, if Krishna is unlimitedly great, I'm going to try to, I'm reducing his greatness by trying to like, okay, let me fit this big thing into my little head so it makes sense. So chintya can mean in some instances, you, you're not going to understand it. It's not like, you know, he's, he's, he's in the material. He's everything, but he's not everything. He's everywhere, but he's over here also. Like, okay, how does that work? He's... He's in every atom, but he's not in every atom. Right? Like Prabhupada gives the example. People, people who would meet Prabhupada, they say, they would say, God is great. And Prabhupada would say, No. His greatness is that he's not just great, he's Anutama. He's Mahatma, Mahatama and Anutama. He's bigger than the biggest, greater than the greatest, simultaneously smaller than the smallest. He's bigger and greater than everything and everyone, and he's inside the atom. He's tiny. Anutama. Mahatama Anutama. That's his greatness. So people are just like, what, what? How is he bigger, the biggest and the smallest? You can't be the biggest and the smallest. 
I, I, I won the gold medal, but I came in last place. You, you can't do both. You do one or the other, right? So that's the meaning of a chintya. It's like, it's not... I mean, it's conceivable through our heart when Krishna reveals it, but materially it's not conceivable. It doesn't make sense. So, you, so it's like, it's okay if you don't understand some things or you get confused because that's, you know, Krishna's like not like us. It's just so easy to figure out. And we can't, you know, we're not going to figure it out with our minds anyway. So much has to be revealed by Krishna. But I want to go back to this other point. I often think that we don't realize how much we're trying to be Krishna because we're devotees and we serve Krishna all day. So we just think, I'm not trying to be like Krishna. I'm trying to serve him. Every desire, every thought, everything in your heart which pushes you in some way to think or act towards personal enjoyment is the desire to be Krishna. You know, it's like, well, I thought desire to be Krishna was Mayavad, you know, and I'm not a Mayavadi. Well, you know. Have you ever wanted honor? Well, I should rephrase that. Have you ever not wanted honor? Yeah. Was there ever a time, and you can remember, when you didn't want to be honored? Yeah. That desire to be honored is the desire to be Krishna, because he is the most honorable. Did you ever desire something for your enjoyment? Of course! That desire, as innocent as it may be, is the desire to imitate Krishna, because that's what he does. He owns everything and enjoys everything. How much do you own? Well, Prabhu, I got a motorcycle. <laughs> no, but that's still, that's Krishna's. You, it's not even yours. It's Krishna's. Like, we own nothing. We don't even own this body. Right? So, I am a servant of Krishna, and I meant to realize that. And if I ask you, if you're, are you a servant of Krishna? You'll say, yes, Prabhu, I'm a servant of Krishna. Like, because that's what I learned in my bhakti class. So that, and that's the right answer. And if I don't give that answer, I might not get breakfast. So that's the answer I'm going to give. Because right? I have to pass the test, stay in the ashram and get breakfast, right? Isn't it? Something like that. Like, a lot of times, devotees will ask me a question, and I'll give two answers. The first answer is, this is the answer to write on your test. And now I'm the next answer is, but this is the real answer. You know, that's the, like, technically speaking, this is the answer. You know, like, you go to the doctor. Well, technically speaking, you have this disease and this is the medication, but it's more complicated and it's deeper and, and we're going to treat it differently. So, technically speaking, I know that I'm a servant of Krishna. But in reality, if we look at our own heart, if we look at our actions, if we look at our thoughts, and we're honest with ourselves, we can say, actually, I don't think I realize that I'm servant of Krishna. And that's why every day we have to chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram. And one of the things that we're doing when we chant, and you may not realize this, but now you will, is we're praying to Krishna to realize that nature of servant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, please help me understand, realize, experience, and act as a servant, because I have this false ego. And the false ego does not think it's a servant at all, does it? False ego thinks, I'm the enjoyer and I'm the master. That's what the false ego thinks. So, you know, in, in, if you wanted a visual of what goes on during japa, it's kind of like you're a, you're a um, sculptor. And you've got this false ego, and it's like, it's just overrunning your whole life, and you're just going, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Ram, 
and every day maybe like a, like a little sand from that stone comes off, you know? And in 800 lifetimes, maybe, you know? You've got like one centimeter, you know? That's what's actually going on. I don't realize I'm a servant. Every time I see some, something that I think is enjoyable, and I think, oh, let me enjoy it, I've completely forgotten that I'm a servant. Otherwise, I would never think like that. Servants don't think about enjoying the property of their master. Do you ever think about enjoying the property of Krishna? I mean, his material world? Yeah, of course. Wow, oh, Prabhu, look at that sunset. That's so beautiful. That's so innocent, right? Isn't it? You know the story? You ever hear that story? When a devotee, it was old, the beginning days, devotees are very young, they don't know anything. They said, oh, Prabhupada, that sunset's so beautiful. And Prabhupada just blew their minds and he said, yes. And if you're attached to that sunset, you'll have to come back and take birth again. <laughs> Whoa, and, you know, the devotee wasn't expecting that. He was expecting, yes, it is beautiful. So then Prabhupada explained what I think we all understand. If you see that as Krishna's beauty and you, um, yeah, you see it as Krishna's beauty, which there then inspires you as a servant, that's different than seeing, oh, that sunset is so beautiful. Let's go, let's go to the park and enjoy the sunset. You ever, you ever use those words? Let's go down here in the evening and enjoy the sunset. Now, for a devotee, we may say, let's go and see the sunset because we say, oh, that's Krishna. That's Krishna's eye. So it's meant, it's not, we're not about enjoying. So every time, this is so subtle because we've done this for a million lifetimes, we don't even know we're doing it, right? It's just we're used to thinking about, let's go for a walk. Let's enjoy. I'm enjoying the scenery. I'm enjoying the weather. I'm enjoying the fresh air. I'm enjoying the company. You know, it's like we are like little enjoyers on, you know, just like, like charged up batteries. You know, everywhere we look. What can I see? What can I hear? What can I taste? What can I touch? What can I smell? That's, you know, that's conditioned soul, right? That's just how we live, isn't it? Yes, like if you're in Vrindavan and you're going shopping and you want to smell something, like you can't smell it, this is for Krishna. You're buying everything for Krishna, right? Don't smell it. You're like, here you go, you want to see if it smells sweet, there. Everything in that city is for Krishna, you can't smell anything like you would do here. So then you realize, oh my God, I'm always thinking about enjoying, right? So therefore, I'm chanting every day, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, please help me realize I am a servant. I am not the center. I am not a controller. I am not the enjoyer. You are. I am meant to help you enjoy. We know this philosophy here. But when you actually look at your conditioning, you realize, I don't really know this. Right? It's like sometimes Prabhupada talks about something it is not, this is not palatable to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it anyway, just to make you all more miserable than I've already made you. You know the purport, it must be in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, where Prabhupada's talking about taking Maha Prasad, which Maha Prasad, of course, is powerful and sacred, and taking too much, and that taking of Maha Prasad is just sense gratification. It's not honoring prasadam, it's sense gratification. Do you know that purport? Any of you read that? It's something like Prabhupada saying, sense gratification in the name of Prasad. Right? And now you're all like, oh my God, that just ruined my breakfast. <laughs> sense gratification in the name of Prasad. So even in taking Prasadam, we're supposed to be in the mood of, this is Krishna Prasadam, I'm honoring it. I'm not the enjoyer, I'm not the center. Right? Hare Krishna. So that's, that's the idea of, of when Krishna is sh Krishna, Krishna is showing off. Like, like sometimes a little kid will show off, like they know how to do something and they go like, watch this, and they'll show off. 
So Krishna's doing that all the time. He's like, watch this. You know, dances on Kaliya, does Ras Lila. He does so many things. Goes in the mouth of demons and throws, you know, he does all, so many things. But Krishna's kind of like, watch this. And he does it and he's like, you can't, you can't do that. Don't even think about it. You are not God, you can't do this. So it's like, watch me do it because I want to show you the difference between me and you. I can do this, you can't. And then when we finally chisel down or deflate that false ego to a certain degree, then we can be happy that Krishna can do it and we can't do it. So we can be happy that Krishna has lots of girlfriends and happy that I don't. But until we're purified, we're unhappy that he's got all the girlfriends and not me, right? We may not think this way consciously, but deep down inside, somewhere, <laughs> that's what it means to be a conditioned soul. Okay, so we can stop there. And Do you have any comments or questions? You? No? Yes? It's wonderful to hear about the glorification of Maharaj Kirtan. But when she runs away, and when the Sukha her, when Mother Earth runs away? He chases her. He chases her. Yeah. He takes the form of a cow and runs away. Yeah. There's quite a conversation going on with him there. From a general people's point of view, the mother of the earth has a statement saying that why should I give my all the facilities to people who are demons practically? Yes. That's what I'm not doing. Yes. And before that a point comes, Pitu says, why you people are glorifying me? I have not done anything. Yes. Let me do something first before you glorify me like this. Yes. That goes before this. So right after that, saying I have not done anything to glorify me, right after that he, he chases her, saying I'm going to cut you into pieces. Without asking her, what's your problem? He didn't ask her, what's your problem? He said, I'm going to cut you into pieces because you have not provided and people are hungry. She didn't have a chance to say anything to him. Then she says, I don't want to give to this chori boot, that means these thieves and rascals. Mm -hmm. So far he has not done anything to correct the situation because in Vena's time things were really bad. And he came to correct the situation and he hasn't done anything to correct it. And when she says, I don't want to give, he really goes tough on her. I don't quite see in a seen to seen way. In general I understand from this verse, he is beyond the forms and he is everything. Fine. But as, as it goes in the like in a drama in the scene to scene, that seems to be slightly not in the sequence, not giving her a chance to ask. Oh, oh, okay. I thought I haven't read the story in a while. I'll make an assumption here that he assumes that she knows what her duty is. So he doesn't have to tell her. You know, so she's not doing her duty. She's refusing to do something that... She gave an explanation. Yeah, after he caught her, right? She gave the explanation, not before. <laughs> right? Actually, she met him, and all the demigods presented gifts to Prithu. And she was there. She gave him a present, a mystic slippers. With that slippers, you can go anywhere you want. That was presented by her to him, mm -hmm. recognizing it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she had already a contact with him. But as I remember the story, it's like, you know, it's like all the, if, if any devata didn't do their duty, he would chastise them, right? Because you, you're a devata or you're, you're in a position where you have your seva and you didn't do it. So either you do it or I'm going to kill you. That's a devotee's position. But ordinary people will think, he didn't ask her, what's the problem, what, why are you not doing this? Yeah. From, from that point of view, common point of view, 
See, even in the modern law, you are not guilty unless you are proved. You are yeah. innocent until you are proved guilty. Yeah, that's outside of this con, right? Yeah, that's. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we know Leela, we know other things. But, see, if you have to speak to somebody, you are... But, but it worked, no, but I would say this. It worked. You might say, that was bad what he did, but he knew what he was doing and it worked and she surrendered. So it's like, we have to get the people fed. I'm not beating around the bush here. How do you feed him or I kill you? You got, you understand? And it was like, oh, that was a very efficient way of getting the job done. But if you think of... But, 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 but he, we could say, he knew she was going to surrender. That's all he had to do is say that, and he knew she was... He, he, he wasn't going to kill her. He could say that, you know. She has three farms. One, she's Mother Earth. Second, she took the farm of a cow. And originally, she's Budevi. Budevi means, you know, like Sri Devi Budevi. She's a consort of Vishnu. She's not an ordinary. She's actually not a demigod because she's consort of Vishnu. Almost like Lakshmi. So there's an instruction through this Leela. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody gave me another example of similar situation. When Ramchandra wanted to uh, go to Lanka, he called out Varuna to come. And Varuna didn't come. He wanted to tell him that we want to make a bridge and you should hold it. Like that. Varuna didn't come, one or two days pass by and then he takes a arrow and says, if you don't come, I'm going to drive you. And then Varuna comes. So, that also seems like Rama was a little, you know, <laughs> pushing him too much a little bit. And they, they gave an explanation that actually, because Rama acted like a human being, and Varuna is a demigod, he is not supposed to respond to human beings. Oh, okay. Whatever they want. And then when Rama came out and said, Now I'm acting like God. If you don't come, I'll tell you. Yeah. So he also said the double. And, and preach is the king, so you can't. King is a representative of God. So disobeying the king. So he is God himself. He's yeah. kind of okay, all right. All the better. But that seems in the sequence, in the, like in a drama, if you see, like we have in our own etiquette. We say first, we ask an explanation. Yeah. Well, you better not mess around with Preacher Maharaj. <laughs> because if you do something wrong, he's the judge and the jury. Um, I, I, my, as I understand that story, it was like an emergency. So we don't have time to talk. It's just like start feeding them, you know. And you have basically one option, feed, you know, you either feed them or die. So that was a very efficient way to get it done. That's, that's how I kind of feel that story, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is going to get the job done. And we could say, we could make an assumption, maybe it's wrong, but we could assume that he, he knew, you know, he's not going to want to kill her, obviously. He knew she would, she would do it. And it's an example for anyone who gives up their duty, then. And uh, uh, one of the, somebody else offered another explanation, saying that I know what I'm supposed to do. I have to handle all these food rascals and thieves. I'm going to do that, but I want you to start doing your service of providing grains and food to people. Because they are not the only people, there are other common people who deserve your, you know, your facilities. So I'm going to take hand with them, but you start doing this. Like saying, oh, yeah, you yeah, you could start say. Doing this, then I'll take care of them. You, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, th it's an interesting story because, because I think everybody's thinking, yeah, why would you want to feed demons? Just let them die. You know, the world would be better. But as Prabhupada often says, it's, it's not on our shoulders. That's their karma. So we don't play God, you know. So we have... We don't go out in the street and say, oh, you know, you're not devotees, you deserve to die, and we're going to destroy all of you. No, everyone has their karma, you leave them. And, you know, as a leader, you have to take care of people, that's your duty, you know. You read in the Bhagavatam, one, one of the things that is so interesting 
in the Bhagavatam is how Prabhupada talks about politics. Like, if we were in charge of the world, what would we do? You know, that's, that's the context of his political discourse, isn't it? You know, really, kings, leaders should do this. Well, no, no leaders are ever going to do that, not, not at least in my lifetime. So it's like, oh, so when I'm a leader, when a devotee's a leader, I know what to do, because Prabhupada talks about it in his books. And what's the context? Innocent people are suffering at the hands of rascal politicians. And we might think, well, it's their karma. Or, you know, they deserve to suffer, or they're not devotees. But Prabhupada's like, no, no, we should establish Krishna consciousness. People are suffering without it. So it's, it's always, a, it's an interesting context. You know, it's not like, forget them, you know? No, people should be employed, people should be fed, government should take care of them, you know, so on and so forth. Which is, it's, it's so much different than what ISKCON does, because that's not our mission. So, that's Prithu's mission also, right? As the king, take care of the people, you know, that's your job. And then gradually, yeah, well, like you're saying, we'll save all the people, then we'll educate them, you know, like that. Just feed them, I'll t like, yeah, feed them, I'll take care of them. Don't worry about it, you know, like that. Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it's, it's, I mean, we can interpret it differently. I, I always felt, I always, I related to her, because I think that I, you know, it's like the doctor, you know? The police finally caught, you know, the biggest criminal that ever lived, and he's got a bullet in him, and if you just like, don't take the bullet out in the next hour, he's dead. And this man has made the lives of hundreds of thousands of people miserable, so like, why would I want to pull the bullet out? But it's your duty as a doctor to save him, right? Isn't it? And so when I, when I first read the story of Mother Bhumi not wanting to feed people, I totally related. I said, yeah, why would you want to feed a bunch of people who are ruining the world and, and so... But... Um, so innocent people also, apart from the thieves... Yeah, that's there also. They yeah. have to be taken that's true, that's true. Yeah, so you got to, the rain falls on the ocean and falls on the earth, and you got to take care of everybody. And like we're saying, at least if they're alive, you can educate them. But um, there's so many things you can extract from the story. But isn't the story focused on the, the glories of Maharaj Prithu and his strength and his dharma? And it's like, wow, he's, he's taking responsibility. And even... He's taking so much responsibility for the people that even Mother Earth disobeys him. He's willing to kill her because it's, it's a dharmic. In his mind, it, what she's doing is a dharmic. And we have to establish dharma at any cost. And we'll, you know, that's the way I've always understood it. But I'm, I'm on Bhumi's side a lot. Because <laughs> I feel that way all the time. Because the world is, you, know, you just go out there and look at what people are doing. And it's like, you know, if you weren't alive, I think the world would be a lot better. You know, like about, you know, five and a half billion of you weren't here, um, or six billion, and leave a few million left, we could start over and make a better world. Um, so I think we can relate to Bhumi, no? There are two, two types of stories. In some stories, Mother Lakshmi tells the Lord, your devotee is suffering, why are they sitting here? You help them. And yeah. sometimes the Lord tells the Lord Lakshmi anything, he rushes out. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell Lakshmi. So Lakshmi is wondering all the other news. That, so like that, there's a different, uh, you know, rasas flowing here. So here in this case, even though Bhumi is the you know, consort of the Lord, he first chastises her, why are you not feeding my children? Yes. Now he has a vow of a father. Why are they not feeding the child on the time? Yes. 
You are twice the keeping the child waiting. Or the bab of a husband. Yeah, like that. So we can say that. Yeah. You may say, no, I, you know, this is gas is not that, this is not that, that is not that. <laughs> <laughs> Why you don't have a good <laughs> Treat the child tomorrow. Yeah. You worry about what you don't have. You say, this is not there. Something is going on. This is, well, you feel something. Because the child is trying to feel. No. Yeah. Then you worry what you don't have. Just get to that. Yeah, yeah. It could be like household. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an example, isn't it? Like, dharma is so important. The Lord comes down, like an ordinary family, you know, father of the children, and says, what, stop this child crying? Yeah, yeah. And Prabhupada often says how Krishna loves us so much that he's supplying everything, even we totally ne <coughs> neglect him. So it's kind of like, you know, if Krishna is doing that, certainly Prita Maharaj wants to, you know, continue, right? Then who's Bhumi to, to interfere with that? Well, actually, his anger is a reflection of his affection for the people. Yeah, exactly. Because he sees their suffering. Yeah. So that makes him act, act as if he's Yeah, acting. exactly. It has nothing to do with Mother Gala as such. Yeah, yeah, right. As a consequence, he's upset with her. But he's angry when Dharma is broken. Which is, Chatriya is angry when Dharma is broken. When irreligion arises, he's angry. So he might be angry at the people he's fighting. He doesn't really hate them, he hates a Dharma. And they represent a Dharma. So he's fighting them. But, you know, when the sun sets, they're eating dinner together. Right? So it's like, how does that make sense? You're eating dinner with the people you tried to kill a few hours ago. But you're really trying to kill a dharma. And they represent it. I've got nothing against you, other, you know, you're a nice guy, you know, we can play chess tonight. But you're representing a dharma, so, you know, as long as you're representing a dharma, I, I'm against a dharma, so I'm, I'll kill you. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Yeah, you had a question? A dharma, a dharma, a dharma. Yes. So she told about you know, how like we do things, but we're doing uh, things for our sense and enjoyment, and we are not truly conscious. Like uh, pure consciousness isn't there. So, but like. Uh, being like me being a neophyte, like how do I come up to like consciousness? Like, yeah. Every morning, when you're chanting your rounds, you're begging to Krishna, please help me understand and realize that I'm a servant. And please help me through the day to realize that. Just to have some understanding and some vision and some desire to be a servant and you know it's important to be conscious of what the process of Krishna consciousness is meant to do and that's what it's meant to do reestablish us in our position as servant so when, when you realize how deeply ingrained the mentality of enjoyer is and how, how I may intellectually understand I'm a servant and I may even engage in service, even while I still think I'm an enjoyer. Because then I'll end up enjoying, trying to enjoy the service. You ever done that? Do devotional service and try to enjoy it? Like, this is for Krishna, I'm just going to imitate Krishna while I'm serving him. You know, it's like a real paradox. So, so as you become conscious of this and you realize how deeply rooted it is, it, it really should cause you to, your, it should cause your japa to be more intense because you realize how much you need the holy name and how, much, how important it is to realize I'm a servant and how difficult it can be because the enjoying spirit is so subtle. So I'm just, every morning I'm just praying, Krishna, help me realize I'm a servant. We... We say, oh, Krishna, please engage me in your service, but it also means please help me realize that I am a servant. Otherwise, how would I engage in the service? You know, 
we were joking the other day, I think maybe here, how you, you, you're chanting japa, and while you're chanting japa, you want to get honored. You want other people to like notice you. It's like, what's that all about? You know, this is like, this is the yuga dharma. This is the way I become purified. And I'm doing the yuga dharma, hoping to get some, some honor for it. That's how deep the desire to enjoy is. It's like, it's like, you know, I'm doing devotional service, but I'm trying to get side benefits. Maybe I'll get, you know, upward mobility with it. I'll get the maha. I'll get my own room. I'll get more honor, you know, whatever. Right? That's it's just, it's not, it's not you have to kill yourself because you feel that way. It's just, it's just recognizing that's where we're coming from. And therefore, how much I need to take shelter of the holy name to purify that and take shelter of all the processes of bhakti. And then also, what, you know, the more you understand this, the easier it is to see it and catch yourself when you start going in that direction. But, and the more you see it, the more it empowers your japa because you realize how much I need the holy name. Because, you know, maybe you came, before you came to this class, you were thinking you were bad. Now you're thinking, wow, I'm much worse than I thought I was. <laughs> but... But that's good because now you realize, you know, I think I need the holy name more than I thought I did. You know, I, I thought I could get by with a few schnick schnicks and mom moms, you know. But now I realize, nah, that's not gonna work. If I'm gonna purify this enjoying spirit, I'm gonna need some pretty serious japa. So that's good. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, if we're if you're doing service for Krishna's enjoyment it will be it will be relishable naturally it will come so if the happiness is coming as a result <coughs> of you trying to please Guru and Krishna that's just his mercy that you're, you know, because you're actually experiencing some ananda you know, which is transcendental so that's good because that experience of Ananda purifies the enjoying spirit. So there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're enjoying sense gratification through service, then it's, it's like it's a paradox. You know, because the, the goal of service is that Krishna will be, his sense gratification will be, will be multiplied, not mine, right? So, <clears throat> You know, we have kirtan and it was enjoyable. That's great, as long as you don't think you're the enjoyer. As long as you're not like putting yourself in Krishna's position. Oh, I'm gonna lead the kirtan and everyone will think I'm great. And so now I'm, I'm in the purusha bhav doing the kirtan. So I'm not really doing kirtan, I'm just, just material. It could be, right? So yeah, so I could be doing devotional service for my own sense gratification and then therefore getting some happiness. But that's not the happiness we want. We want to avoid that. I want happiness that comes from pleasing Krishna. Right? Like if you do something nice for Krishna, that makes you happy and you enjoy it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Like you put on a Rathyatra, you make so much sacrifice, and then it's successful. At the end of the day, you're so happy. And you enjoyed the whole festival. But it was transcendental enjoyment because a devotee's enjoyment is not a devotee's enjoyment comes from Krishna being pleased. Then it's like, that's perfect. That's real enjoyment. Any other enjoyment, it's like cheating. It's kind of like going in the kitchen and just eating. Just picking up something and eating. Can you go back to that? So the sense of 
cheating, what was it in relation to? The body's not hampered by the material body. Yeah, thus there was no possibility of the earth cheating him because he knew everything past, present, and future. So where, what the idea of this is about cheating? Hmm. Isn't, isn't it referring to Bhumi? After King Prutu gave his royal command, the planet earth in the shape of a cow could understand that the king was directly empowered, a directly empowered incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Consequently, the king knew everything past, present, and future, thus there was no possibility of the earth cheating him. But where is the idea of cheating him? Well, he's saying, as far as I would understand, he's saying, don't do this, and she's going to like, she already did it, like, she knows it's wrong, but she already did it, so she's already kind of trying to cheat him, or she's going to argue and lie or make an excuse or in some way, you know, try to get herself out of, out of this difficulty. Yeah, I am. But I wouldn't think she would want to cheat him. She knows who he is. And she, he wants, but she already. Sloka is about who he is. But she already cheated. She already cheated. I think this is past tense. I think it already happened. So Prabhupada's saying, sounds like he's saying, from this point on, you know, you just have to do what he wants because you can't, you know, you you acted independently. You can't do that. Just you know. That's what I, I would say. Anyone else have anything? Yes? Thank you very much for this uh, very enlightened class about how the mentality of controllership and indulgence is so much ingrained that any service we are doing in that also, like, by yeah. and hard it is there that you know, devotees will recognize us and I will get name, fame, and these things. So basically, I'm trying to be Krishna, the competitor of Krishna. Yeah, in a subtle, maybe more subtle way than Donald Trump or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so my question was, actually the nature of the soul, as some part of it already answered, uh, the nature of the soul is actually Ananda, uh, which uh, yeah. is seeking, that it is looking for happiness. Now the spiritual happiness are like quite above, even though like when I'm trying to change Japan with that the consciousness that Lord, please engage in your service and please give me that strength by which I can realize that I am your servant. But still, that is, you know, uh, seeing that platform that actually Krishna is you know, pleased with my services, that is quite high for them. Now, that is high and, you know, uh, the nature of the soul is to look only for happiness. Yeah. So, so what to do so in, the, immediately available in the meantime? <laughs> yeah. uh. So, eat, eat more gulab jamans, you'll be fine. <laughs> the thing to understand is, I mean, that is one of the ways Prabhupada got us, you know, sweet balls. But any service that you do sincerely is accepted by Krishna. Krishna is pleased, Prabhupada is pleased. So knowing that they're pleased brings pleasure, even if it's not, even if the service is difficult, or I'm not experiencing pleasure for whatever reason because maybe I'm not pure enough to experience it. But just knowing that they're pleased is like, it brings so much happiness. Knowing that Krishna is happy with my effort, Krishna sees my sincerity. And then also being happy with yourself that you're trying, right? So there's a kind of happiness there. And even if I fail, but I get up, there's a kind of happiness that I didn't give up. And there's also a kind of happiness in appreciating that I have this opportunity, even though maybe I'm not doing it as well as I would like to. But the fact is that somehow or other, by Krishna's like inconceivable grace, I'm here, I have this mercy. And so that's always, a, that's always like a constant form of happiness in a sense. You could call it happiness, satisfaction, pleasure. It's always there. So 
in that interim state, you may not be experiencing deep, deep transcendental ecstasy, but these other things can be experienced all the time, right? And naturally, you know, Krishna will encourage you and give you some transcendental happiness. And at least it's my experience that any time I try to do the right thing, I always feel satisfied. Maybe not, you know, it's not high levels of ecstasy, but it's satisfaction that, you know, I, I did what Prabhupada wanted and I, can, I feel like properly situated. I feel satisfied in Krishna consciousness. I'm not feeling despondent. I'm not feeling envious of others, I'm satisfied. So if we follow, we'll, we'll, always, we'll always get that. You just pick up the Gita and discuss it with another devotee, you'll feel satisfied. Learn a verse or two, you'll feel satisfied. You know, Be sincere in your service, you'll feel satisfied. Is that okay? Thank you. Anything else? Since you mentioned the last drum, <laughs> You mentioned his name. Who? Trump. 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 Oh, Donald Trump. Do we need Prithu now or not? Do we need Prithu in America? Because Ben is back again. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you. People in America are wondering, saying that uh, we neither want this fellow nor want that fellow. Yeah, and there's no third fellow. <laughs> so basically, we have nobody. Well, that's a kind of a good realization that yeah. nobody's qualified. Right. The situation of the superpower. I think Modi should also be president of the U.S. I guess. <laughs> Start establishing some more tirthas and protect the cows. And that would be fantastic. Um, the. Um, you know, how many references has Prabhupada made to how society suffers because of misleaders? There's like so many, so many. And then Prabhupada, it's interesting, he uses the word innocent people. Like, like we think, well, if there's karma, nobody's innocent. And he uses the word innocent. Like, innocent people suffer when there are misleaders. Wow. Yeah. They, they leave the cities and go to forests. Yeah. They run away from the leaders because they're being taxed and harassed. You know, so we always think, well, you know, every, every detail of a person's life is a consequence of their karma. And Prabhupada seems to be saying that's not the only thing. It's misleaders. You know, and then, you know the story, was it Ramchandra? Puri. And his whole, because of his offense to Nityananda, everyone in his village suffered. And, and in the purport, Prabhupada said, or the verse says, just see, for the offense of one person, the whole village suffered. And you don't get the, it doesn't, it, it's not saying, well, everyone's karma was bad, so they ended up in this village, and then, you know, by divine arrangement, Ramachandra Puri, who lived in the village, would offend so that you don't get your karma. It doesn't say that. It just says you're associated with the karma of this person you suffer. So it seems like Prabhupada's saying the same thing. Bad leader, people suffer. Good leader, leader people will enjoy. Which, which, in a sense, kind of just subverts the whole philosophy of karma, which then helps us understand that karma is not black and white the way we, we like to think it is. And I think that's important. You know, like... Like one sannyasi was asked, why did, why were children in, in our movement abused? And he said, it's their karma. And, and I, a devotee told me that, and I said, I think it's the neglect of ISKCON, it's the fault of ISKCON, it's not their karma. It's our, you know, so I think that's more realistic, you know, bad leader allowed it. Because how could someone being born as devotee have such bad karma? Like it doesn't make sense. So, um, yeah, these are nuances of karma, and you know, I, I, I have a problem with black and white thinking because I don't see the world as black and white. 
And I don't think we, we, we get to the truth when we're too black and white, because the truth is nuanced. There's, you know, it's a, there's a lot, and there's 360 degrees, not like, you know, one degree. So anyway, that's for another class. Anything else? You know, you know, I want to hear something interesting in answer to your question. Prabhupada has used the word enjoy. So I was in a temple and we had the deities called Radha Gididhari. And I believe they were the first Radha Gididhari deities in Iskon, first or second, probably the first. So our temple was about three blocks from the biggest park in the city. And so we would do festivals in the park and we wanted to do Govardhan Puja festival. And we made buckets and buckets and buckets of gulab jamans and the temple president would just walk up to people and say, open your mouth. And he put gulab jamans in. And he had, you know, he was just like, we had a great time. And, and Prabhupada knew we were doing the festival. And in a letter, Prabhupada said, I hope you enjoyed the festival. So, yeah, because Krishna's, in, Krishna's the center of enjoyment of the festival, so you can enjoy it also, right? You can enjoy prasadam because you're not the enjoyer of prasadam. Krishna was the enjoyer of prasadam, so now you can enjoy it. So that always keeps you out of the position of enjoyer because you offered it to him. So this festival was for Krishna's enjoyment and I can enjoy it as a devotee. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. We will end class now. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. So it's so positive to have so much enlightenment on this section. So the Surprise, surprise. <laughs> What's your class?